Good morning. Um, we are continuing our series today on emotionally healthy spirituality. And today we are going to talk about the topic of grief. Um, and so I wanted to take a moment to give a disclaimer because this is a, a heavier topic. And I wanted to say that um, I understand that different people have experienced different types of grief. And we have also experienced different levels of grief. And so me standing up here speaking this morning, there are undoubtedly people in this room who have experienced a different type of grief than I have. And there are also people who have experienced a deeper level of grief than I have experienced at this point in my life. And so my goal this morning is to find biblical principles uh, that will apply to any level of grief in any situation. And my hope is that we can take that and we can apply it to whatever your individual grief situation, your individual pain looks like. Sound good? So I wanna start with this question, which is um, why? why? Why talk about grief? Why is dealing with grief important? And the truth is that grief is something that is promised to us. Everyone will experience grief if you live long enough in your life. We, cannot, we got, cannot go through this life because of sin. We cannot go through this life without experiencing pain and without experiencing suffering. And even Jesus himself said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So, so grief and suffering and pain, it's promised to us. And when not dealt with, grief has the potential to be the death of us. See, one common way to handle the feelings of grief is just to stuff them down inside of you. And, and you feel like if you can do that for long enough, eventually those feelings will just go away. Uh, if you've ever had a wound on, on like a sore or an open cut on your arm, you would know that if you deal with that, that wound, it will heal. But if you cover it and you try to pretend that it is not there, what happens is it will fester. And over time, it will become worse. And the pain will become worse, but also the damage that it can do to you will become worse. I have found uh, in marriage that one of the things that happens that I've had to grow in is that my, something will be bothering me or frustrating me, and I will not want to bring that thing up to Kaylee because I don't want to deal with the conflict that comes with it. And so I will stuff that feeling inside of me, and I will, I will cover that wound. And over the course of time, that internal wound too will fester, and it will get worse, and it will affect more of me, and eventually it leaks and it will leak into the things that I say to her, and it will leak into my perspective towards her, and then eventually, eventually, it explodes. And so the truth is that internal wounds, like external wounds, need to be dealt with. And if not, grief will fester, and it will become worse, and it will affect more of us until eventually we rot from the inside out. And so grief, when not dealt with, has the power, has the potential to be the death of us. But when dealt with, grief has the power to bring depth to your faith. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So if you have a physical or digital Bible, we're going to be in the book of Job. We're going to be kind of hopping around. And Job is wisdom literature. So it actually goes with the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Um, but it is dealing with wisdom specifically in the area of grief. And so my goal this morning is to look at Job's story and to see how principles from that story, the wisdom of God can be applied to our lives today. So a little bit of backstory about Job as we get started. The first thing that you see about him is it says he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So he is a, a good guy. He's also super wealthy. That's the second thing you find out. He has thousands of sheep and camels and oxen and donkeys and servants that work for him. He is described as the greatest man among all the people of the East. And so Job has a lot going for him at the beginning of this story. And right away, uh, Satan comes to God and he says, does Job fear God for nothing? And so essentially, what he's saying is, well, God, you have given this man everything, and so of course he loves you. But if you were to strip away the things that he has, if you were to strip away the gifts, he would turn and curse the giver. 
And so God gives Satan the power to affect everything that Job has, but he says, you cannot touch a hair on his head, but the, the possessions that he has, you can affect. And so this is Job chapter one. This is what happens directly after that conversation. It says, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties. They swept down on your camels and they made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So you see that the book of Job deals in extremes, right? This is a rough day, a rougher day than I would say probably most of us have experienced, but it actually continues to get wilder than this. It will get worse before it gets better for Job because immediately after this, Satan goes back to God and God says that God says to Satan, Job maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. And Satan responds by saying in essence that Job is maintaining his love for God only because his body remains intact. He has lost his possessions, but his body maintain, remains intact. And so he will not curse God. But surely if his body were to experience suffering, he would turn and curse God. And so God gives Satan the ability to impact Job's body, but says you cannot take his life. And this is what happens immediately after that. This is Job chapter two. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. And so here we have our first interesting juncture, I would say, of the story of Job, because Job wife, Job's wife represents one way that people deal with grief, and that is to give up. She says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. There are some countries in which uh, when a husband dies, the widow will wear black for the entirety of the rest of her life as an outward showing that this, this significant piece of her has died. She will never wear anything but black for the rest of her life. We may not take that external approach, but the truth is that grief will always make it feel as though something has died inside of you. And when you feel like something has died inside of you, you too want to turn and curse God and die. And here's something that's important. It is possible to physically live while experiencing death. It looks like a world in which you stop giving and receiving love. A world in which you stop trying to find joy in the things that you're doing. You no longer look for things that, find, that, that would help you to experience joy and you no longer find joy in the things that you are doing. It looks like a world in which you have turned away from God and so you no longer know a peace that comes from him. She says, curse God and die. Turn your back on him. And so what does Job say in these situations? The first, first chapter, he said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In the second ch chapter, he said, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And it says in both that Job did not sin in what he said. So everything that Job believed about God was rooted in an, an 
understanding that God is inherently good. Job believed at his core that God is good. And so more than the good gifts that God gave, Job relied on the giver of those gifts. And this doesn't mean that Job didn't grieve. You see in the first chapter where he, sh- he, he, he tears his clothes and he shaves his head, unlike now where that's a really common cool style. Um, back then, uh, to, to tear your robes and to shave your head, those were signs of mourning. But the difference between Job's grief and the way that his wife grieves is that she sees his pain as a death sentence. And Job sees his pain as an opportunity for dependence. And that is why she tells him to curse God and die, and he turns and worships. It's because to her, his pain is a death sentence. And to him, his pain is a call to his reliance on God. We experience loss all the time. There are uh, basic losses that we experience just from growing up. We lose our youthfulness. We lose our dreams as we grow and some of our dreams die. As we get older, we lose our stability. There are seasons of life where we lose our stability. We lose our freedoms and our independence. We lose our influence over other people. And then there are catastrophic losses. There are losses where the people who we love die. And there are losses where the the deep relationships, our marriages and our lifelong friendships end. And there are medical diagnoses and there are unexpected losses of our jobs. And all of those losses, the, the little and the catastrophic, they cause pain. We don't have a choice in whether or not we feel pain. We are made in the image of a God who feels pain. And so we feel pain as well. But we do have a choice in what pain drives us to. So our pain can desensitize us to our life. Our pain can stop us from loving people. Our pain can stop us from pursuing things that bring us joy, things that we enjoy in life. Our pain can stop us from depending on God for our peace. Our pain can uproot and displace our faith. Or our pain can drive us back to God. We can acknowledge how we are feeling in front of him. We can acknowledge who he is and we can experience restoration, though very slowly oftentimes, in our dependency and in our struggle with God. And that's how we can do it in worship and honesty. And so this is the difference between Job and Job's wife. She says, your pain points to your death. And he says, my pain points to my dependency. And so that's the first conversation, the first interesting juncture of the book of Job. And then once you hit Job 3 until the end of Job 37, the entire book is a discourse between Job and his friends. So we're not going to read the whole thing today. Um, But Job 3 until the end of Job 37, Job and his friends have essentially a 25 chapter argument about why Job is suffering. And so here we see another way that people are prone to deal with grief, and that is control of the why. You see, over and over throughout the book of Job, his friends justify his suffering to him by saying that if he is suffering, he must have done something to deserve this to happen in his life. They talk about defending God in front of him. And and some of the statements that they make about God are true. They say things like dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. But their purposes in their defense of God is to convince Job that he has sinned to bring this suffering on himself. And so his friends are operating in an assumption that God is good. And so if you do good things, good things will happen to you. But Job, bad things are happening to you. So something in your life must be bad for that to be the case. And they miss that because of sin, there can be real injustice that happens independent of our actions. And we think that we don't think like this today, except that when you are watching someone's children misbehave, you're like, wow, I wonder what those parents did to cause that to happen or when it's your kids that are misbehaving, you're like, I wonder what I did to cause this to happen. (laughs) Or someone gets a medical diagnosis and we say, what did they do earlier in their life that would have caused this to happen now? 
or we receive a medical diagnosis and we think, what did I do earlier in my life that led to this happening now? So what happens when we try to explain away or blame away or control the why behind our grief? What happens when we try to control it by rationalizing it with a reason that does not include the brokenness of the world that we live in? And what happens is we'll always come up with an answer. You can always come up with a reason, a control why behind your grief, but it won't be the right answer. And so you'll lie to yourself. You'll tell yourself that you can understand completely why you are experiencing the pain that you are feeling. And over the course of time, what happens when you lie to yourself in order to gain a semblance of control over what you are feeling is that you'll start to believe the lie. This is why that person was taken from me. This is why I received the diagnosis that I did. This is why I got laid off. When you lie to yourself for long enough, you believe it. And when you believe a lie about yourself and about the situation that you are in, you will now allow yourself to stay in the most unhealthy of places because you can justify yourself why you deserve to be there. And so you won't walk forward in your life. You will sit right where you are. And actually, it will be even more torturous because you can tell yourself that you deserve to be there. And so Job's friends, in the process of trying to make him feel better with their justification, in the process of trying to make the situation better with their justification, they are actually making his situation more torturous. And so let's return now to Job. We've seen how his wife deals with grief. We've seen how his friends, return, uh, how his friends deal with grief. Let's look at how Job deals with his grief. The first thing is that he refuses to believe throughout the entirety of this book that he is suffering because of some unconfessed sin. However, he gets really brutally honest with some of these conversations about where he is at and what he is feeling. He says this, May the day of my birth perish. The night that it is said a boy is conceived, that day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it and may no light shine on it. And note here that Job is not cursing God and dying the way that his wife said that he should because he's not turning away from God. He is actually expressing such deep anguish that he longs to die. And he's doing that in front of God. He is actually complaining to God. He says, how I long for the months gone by, the days when God watched over me. He's complaining. He's turning to God, the creator of all things, and complaining and grieving and being real. So again, Job is not hiding his feelings. He is not cursing God. He is not rationalizing his pain. He is expressing what he feels and he's expressing it deeply. Cursing God and dying is different from this. You see, Job is accusatory, and Job is ugly. But he is accusatory and ugly in front of God. Cursing God is to turn away in our grief. That is not the same as being angry in front of God, and it's not the same as being angry at God. The opposite of love is not anger, and it's not even hatred, it's apathy. It's turning away. And Job doesn't turn away. And so then, in chapter 38, God speaks to Job. For the first time in the whole book, God speaks directly to him. And this is what he says. It starts out and he says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. If God ever said that to me, I would be very underprepared for whatever was coming next. And so for three chapters, God talks to Job directly about God's own understanding and power and compassion and creativity. And there's one point where Job kind of slips in there and he's like, ah, I don't know what to say. And God's like, nope. He's like, I I'm going to, Job responds and says, I, I can't even reply to you. And God says, nah, nah, brace yourself. I'm going to talk to you and you will answer me. And then he keeps going and God talks more about his creativity and his power and his compassion. And then 
Job has this second response, and it's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, because to me, it's not just at the heart of understanding suffering. This verse is the heart of understanding a relationship with God. And the more that we understand God, the closer that we get to him, the more that I have found this statement is true. It says, Job chapter 42, it says, then Job replied to the Lord, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things that are too wonderful for me to know. We are unlikely to have a complete understanding of most of the grief that we will experience on earth. But we can know in the middle of it that no purpose of God can be thwarted. And we can know that there are things about God that are simply too wonderful to know. And as we get to know God, as we get to see more of God, the way that God reveals himself to Job in this passage, that's where we can respond with the awe that Job responds with here. But what about the rest of the book? Was Job wrong? That is the big question. I mean, didn't God start off his sentence with, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. So wasn't Job wrong to complain? Wasn't he wrong to turn to God in his anger? Wasn't he wrong to express all of his emotions in front of God? Because of the abrasiveness of that statement, I have often viewed this as a, a three chapter God reprimanding Job for crying out, a berating of Job for crying out. But there's something interesting that happens after the conversation that God has with Job. Right afterwards, the next thing that happens is that God goes to Job's friends, the ones that were just defending God to Job and justifying his pain, and he reprimands them. And he says, you did not speak truthfully about me the way that my servant Job did. These are the people who on the surface, they were defending God to Job. They were telling Job, if something's wrong, it's your fault. You're responsible for it. They're the ones that God reprimands. And Job, who is honest and grieving and openly crying out in front of God for the duration of this book, this is the man who God says, this man spoke truth about me. I believe that God meant what he said to Job. And if I don't read malice into it, it sounds like this. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. When God says, I shall question you and you shall answer me, it's an invitation. It is an invitation to converse with God in the middle of Job's grief. And then when Job didn't respond the first time, when his first response was, I have no reply, God says the same thing again. I will question you and you shall answer me. The undercurrent of the entire book of Job is that God welcomes the spectrum of human emotion. For people who grieve way, way, way too often, we feel like that is the one thing that God doesn't want us to bring to him. Like if we have life with Jesus, if, we, if we're following Jesus, then everything should just be okay. But here we see an honest dialogue between God and a man, and it ends in this beautiful acceptance from Job where he sees more of God. And he is in awe of God's complete sovereignty. And at the same time, it ends with God honoring the man for speaking truth about him. It can be hard to understand what it is like to be a real life human being. This is a great book, but to be a real life human being who suffers and who turns to God in it. And so this week, um, Jonathan and Stephen had the chance to sit down with Tony and Susan Martirana, who's a couple from our church. Um, and they talked about the story of losing their teenage son, their oldest son. Um, and if I really, there's only two things that I want you to take away from this morning. And one of them is that you really, really, really should go watch this video. It will add to your life. It will be uh, a beautiful depiction of what it looks like to grieve in front of God. And you can go to ourcalvary.org slash grief. Um, after today, legitimately, it's one of two things that I want you to take away is that you really should go watch this video. But what you will see 
in the clip that I'm about to show you um, is that grief is real and it's raw and it's welcomed by God. So if you'll turn your attention to the screen. I wrestled with God, you know, why, why, you know, here we are giving you everything. And, I, and then I came to the conclusion of it, we're not any different than anybody else. You know, it, it isn't that, you know, our child should have lived and others shouldn't, you know. So I became very angry for a while and, and it really rocked my faith. And I, I didn't enjoy going to church. I didn't like worship at all. Worship was really hard. Can you explain that? What, what, what was it about worship that worship, specifically? Worship, just getting up and singing with my hands up and praising the Lord for how wonderful he was. I didn't think he was wonderful at all. You know, it, it was very, very hard to um, process that. How do I love a God that, that he could have made, he could have turned this around. I know he took many children out of comas. I knew people, but why not mine? I looked at the scripture in, in book of Matthew chapter eight, where it speaks of the apostles going into a storm and Christ is in the boat with them. And they scream out because they're perishing. Uh, I mean, it's an, a major storm. And I realize I'm in a major storm and I'm crying out, I'm going down. And because I, I didn't think I had faith so I read the scripture and, it's, and the Lord says, where's your faith to these men? You're, you're timid. And I felt like, oh, man, I was, I'm too timid. I, I didn't have the faith. And then the Lord said, I didn't say the, that they should have the faith to stop the storm. I wanted to let them know that they need the faith to know I'm in the boat. And I, I realized Jesus was in the boat. And I said, I'm going to sit next to you and hold you because I'm afraid of going down. So God welcomes the spectrum of human emotion. And if it was true for Job, and if it was true for Tony and for Susan, then it is also true for you. So the question becomes, how do we go about grieving to God as seen through the wisdom of the book of Job? How do we grieve the way that he did, the way that in the end God says, this man spoke truth about me? And the first is uh, pay attention to how you feel in the most raw moments. I think sometimes we feel like uh, we can cover our emotions by the time, and then we can bring them to God. We can feel them, and then we can process them, and then we can bring them to God. But no, there is no penalty for coming to God with how you are feeling in the moment, how you are feeling it. And in fact, the book of Job shows that God welcomes that raw emotion. So the first is pay attention to how you are feeling in the raw moments. The second is to find ways to put those feelings into words. Kelly and I have a friend uh, who lost their older sibling uh, over 10 years ago, and she just recently started writing a book in which she is putting uh, her feelings, her grief, into words. And she may never show that with anyone, or she may, but the point is that there is power in verbalizing what you are feeling. There's power in speaking it out loud. If there's no one around, there's power in speaking it out loud to people. And believe me, there is so much power in taking what you are feeling and writing it down. And sometimes you actually need other people's words to be able to put your feelings into words, and that is great. That is why support groups, both, both formal and informal, talking to people who have experienced what you experience is so valuable because sometimes someone else can put the words to what you are feeling. Again, that's another reason that I would say, go watch that video because if you have grieved, there will be something that they say in that video. I got to watch the whole thing this week. There will be something that they say in that video that will put words to what you are feeling. I do this a lot of times with music, actually, also. Um, I will listen to a song and it will put words to what I'm experiencing. And Kaylee does it with a book. She has a book of prayers and, and there's a prayer for all of the different things, the different rhythms of your life, the different things that you are feeling. But find ways to put words to your feelings and then share those things openly with God. It's easy to miss this because we will grieve to ourselves and we will grieve to other people, but we won't take our pain to him. So take your feelings that you have put into words and make them a prayer. 
I said there were two things I wanted you to take away from this message. The first was that you need to go watch that video. The second is that Job is an invitation to prayer in the midst of grief. Take the things that you feel, put them into words, and bring them to God. And the fourth thing, and the other thing that I think we often miss, is to pay attention to who God is. Job's story doesn't end with his spewed emotions. It then continues into a space of understanding deeper who God is. And so this is what we miss is that we must weigh the tension of how we feel in this moment with the understanding that God is an all-powerful ruler. And we must recognize that while his perfect plan for humanity is distorted by sin, yes, that his purposes will not be thwarted. His perfect purpose will not change. And there will be a day in which all will be made right again. And there's a bridge. There's a bridge between the all-powerful and the suffering. And that bridge is Jesus. He is the all-powerful. He is the greatest suffering. And he is the reason that when we suffer now, we can turn to God and know that there is a future for us. And so in the right now, God invites us to wrestle with him in honest prayer and in worship. And he offers to show us more of himself when we do that. So we're gonna do a closing song a little different today. Um, I'm bringing the couple worship team people out. Um, This is not a song that you will sing along with. You are welcome to close your eyes. Um, You are welcome to look at the words. They will be on the screen. For the last several years, Kaylee and I have had a couple prayer requests that we have prayed consistently. Um, And this was last year. And we had this moment where we were, we were talking to each other and we were frustrated because we felt like we'd been praying for the same things over and over and over again and nothing had changed. And so from that place, I wrote this song and it's called A Prayer for Unanswered Prayers. And it was my frustration expressed directly to God. And so my hope is that if you are somebody who is experiencing grief or pain or suffering this morning, that these can be some of those words that put your feelings into a prayer. And if you are not grieving this morning, then my hope is just that this would be an example of what it looks like to be honest in front of God in your grief. And before that, there's one more clip that I wanna show you um, from from Tony uh, that kind of captures this, this understanding of enduring faith. People think that achieving faith is the faith that really is amazing. Everybody wants to see, lay hands on the sick and they be healed. But what I learned is that enduring faith will teach you much more and take you deeper into the heart of God than achieving faith. And it speaks in the Word of God where people who saw the miracles and everything, they, they drifted away. But when you endure with Christ the pain and, and the suffering and you see how he works through it, it absolutely uh, builds your faith to the place where you, you can encourage others. 